Good afternoon. You're listening to Gambling with an Edge. Now here are your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is gambling attorney Bob Nersessian. Bob Nersessian, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks so much for having me. Well, before we get into an Nersessian question, uh, Richard got some news from Spotify recently. Can you share that with us, please? Uh, yeah. So at the end of, well, not really the end of the year, at the end of November, uh, Spotify sends out this thing called Rap, which is uh, just a little video they put together about your stats of your podcast for the year. And a uh, couple of interesting things. Uh, one was we were, and I find this amazing, uh, very hard to believe considering there's a billion podcasts, but we were in the top 5% of all podcasts, uh, which is amazing. And uh, that is due to you, our listeners. Also, uh, we were listened to in 51 countries, which that's really amazing. And our number one episode uh, for the year was the last episode we did with Bob Nersessian. So. We figured we had to have him back. Now, I should uh, mitigate that a little bit by saying this is only on Spotify, and our podcast goes out in many different places, but on Spotify, Bob, you are the most popular guest that we have for the year. So Great to hear. I guess I'll just be humble. <laughs> I know that's hard for you. First question for our humble guests. Can sovereign immunity preclude Resorts Casino from being sued by any gambler in New Jersey? Background. Resorts Casino in Atlantic City is managed and owned by Indian Mohegan Sun. A sovereign immunity precluded Foxwood Casino from being sued by Kelly Sun in Connecticut. Does that affect, does that have any relevance here? It depends on whether or not it is a standing independent casino under the laws of New Jersey or um, the, the bottom line is, has the tribe entered into a compact with New Jersey or did they just open a casino? My take would be is if they just opened a casino and are playing off of the name and doing it as a commercial enterprise, not on a tribal land, not on tribal lands and without a um, compact with the state, they can be sued like any other entity. I would also say that if they are, if there is a compact that grants them the sovereign status, um, yes, you couldn't take, you couldn't take them on in the state court, but from the Pister versus Garcia decision, which right now is only applicable in the Ninth Circuit and a similar case out of Montana as well. Um, you can sue, you cannot sue the casino, but if you can look at what has happened to you and create what is called a tort, a legal wrong out of it, and an employee committed that tort, if the, I think New Jersey's the Third Circuit, if the Third Circuit follows, the Ninth Circuit, then you can sue the employee in the state court. And if you sue the employee in the state court, uh, from my experience, the casino is going to indemnify the employee. An online sports book misgraded a wager. Their cons customer support was no help. I contacted my gaming commission and they, they sided with the sports book. I'm 100% positive my wager was misgraded, and I feel my gaming commission did not do any due diligence in my case. What other options do I have? The wager is worth $2,000. Okay, I'm a little confused here with this question. Uh, please tell me what it means to grade a wager. Presumably I think what he's that, saying, yeah, go ahead, Bob. Presumably that means he won a wager and the casino said he lost it. 
Okay. There's probably not enough information in here because the next one is it's an online sports book. Is it with a major licensed in his state? See, we don't know these things. And there are avenues when a gaming commission um, decides wrongly, again, depending on your state. So without knowing the state, this question just can't be answered. So um, I'm wondering, this may be related to an incident that somebody asked me about where the the casino put up a bad line. So, for example, it was supposed to be uh, the Rams plus seven, and they had it the Rams minus seven. So the person bet, uh, you know, the the other side, and then the casino, after the fact, said oh, this was a bad line, we're not paying. And they called gaming, and gaming said, yeah, you should just get a refund on the ticket. That but was it a says later on the question ticket, that we had talked about earlier, right? The what? That's a later question that we had talked about earlier. Oh, that that's on the list already? Okay, so, yeah, yeah. all right. If that's the question, we'll go when we get there if we get there. And then the next thing is, if this happened in Nevada and it is just moving the line, like you said, yes, you do have further um, venues. It's a um, petition for review in the district court and then um, a petition to review in the Supreme Court of the state of Nevada or the Nevada Appellate Court. And if it's the Nevada Appellate Court, there may even be a route for a further one to the Nevada Supreme Court. Um, so yeah, like six different levels to get an, to get a final answer. But the um, big question here that I'm looking at is, um, no, I, I, I lost my train of thought. Sorry on that. But uh, you losing line one on a two thousand dollar bet. It may not be cost effective to go further. That's one of the ways they get the gamblers. Because it might cost you ten thousand. Might cost an attorney ten um, attorney fee of significantly more than that. You guys are familiar with my young case, right? That's the one where. We took it all the way to the Nevada Supreme Court, and they said patron means patron. It doesn't mean what what you decide is a viable player or not to a casino. Um, and the point is, from my perspective, uh, truly, that was a decision of passion that had been hanging around since the mid-90s uh, that I took all the way up out of to the Supreme Court out of, in no small measure, uh, a desire to force the issue. And I can guarantee you that from every perspective, I lost money on that case. So finding an attorney would be quite difficult. That's it. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and thank you for that. Thank you the for the from the gambling community. Okay, we next have a player who was playing craps at the Mohegan Sun, uh, bought in for $13,000 over a 24 hour period. And this player feels they should have requested this information or oh, the casino stopped the game, said, you have to give us your social security number now that you bought in for 13,000. And the player's upset about this because he didn't know it was coming. Um, okay. I'm guessing your response and, is going to be... CTR goes both ways. Okay. It's when the casino... It's a cash transaction between a casino and a patron. So that 13000 is supposed to have a CTR filed by the financial institution which is the casino. 
They didn't get the information. Now they want to file one. Um, the problem that they have is that they messed up. Um, yes, you're right. They should have requested it uh, earlier on. Um, but uh, even if they then requested it and you refused, you're going to get an even worse report, which is going to be a um, suspicious, SAR, activity. suspicious activity report because you pulled your bet back because you wouldn't identify yourself for them. Um, you can stand on your right to not provide ID uh, in light of uh, FinCEN and the others. There is a common misunderstanding that the casino can compel your ID. Um, from my research, even though FinCEN personnel are saying in um, seminars and stuff that casinos can compel the ID so that the CTR can be completed. I can't find anything in the law that says that. I believe that it is perfectly legitimate to be a refusal. This is a personal opinion. Um, and if you are a refusal at that point, they're just going to throw you out and try to seize your chips. If they try to seize your chips, then you're into a whole new level of conversion and intentional torts. Does that answer the question? I think so. And, and also the guy can feel bad if he wants to. Right? He was seemed to be upset about it and was feeling bad about it. So he, he still retains the right to feel bad. Yes. In, in all and he can, still, he can still probably get away with withholding his ID. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it's just a CTR. It's no big deal. So... You know, I understand so, that, Richard. You understand that. You yeah, no, also I'm, I'm, know that um, advantage gamblers guard that like gold. And yeah, this, I, this is not an advantage gambler if he's playing craps and uh, you know lost thirteen thousand dollars playing craps. I mean, he didn't I say he lost was, anything. Oh, that's right. He said he bought in for thirteen thousand. Right. Yeah. So still, I I doubt he's an AP if he's playing, playing craps. craps. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question. We we spoke about the young case recently. Uh, the young case related to uh, verifying the, the the chips were gained in the act in gambling. Now, to your knowledge, are Vegas casinos backing off the chip verification nonsense now that the gaming is withdrawing support for the scheme in the wake of Young versus Nevada Gaming Control Board? This is a difficult one to answer, and I'm only answering from anecdotal experience, but I have had quite a bit since this occurred. Um, first... I have no way to know whether or not the casinos to some degree are backing off. I do know that some casinos and depending on circumstances and whether or not the casino wants to take a shot at the person are still asserting the, um, the duty of the patron to prove that they won or purchased it's not just one through gambling or got through gambling. It's also the purchase of chips from the cage, but that those came from the casino personally to him through his interaction uh, commercially, be it gambling or buying the chips with the casino. Now, that being said, the decision very specifically stated, if they are a patron, that's the question not whether or not it is shown or proven that that particular person um, gained those casinos through gambling play or purchase. Um, I think that the Supreme Court, when they issued that decision, certainly recognized that that is shifting a burden to an untenable position to place on a player who is just buying chips and playing games and not necessarily going to be 
having any kind of proof against the word of the casino. And the word of the casino is only that we didn't see him play. Well, maybe you weren't watching at the right spot or it was two months ago and you don't have that video anymore. So they said, no, it's a patron. If it's a patron, you pay the patron. Um, so what we have seen now is casinos are still withhold. Some casinos are continuing to withhold payment and demanding that the patron prove that they won the money there. First thing, that's that falls into the category of a shot because if the patron accepts that explanation and very few patrons have gone out and read the Nevada reports or what the Supreme Court decisions are or even the gambling regulations, if the casino accept, if the patron accepts that explanation, he's already behind the eight ball. Um, only sources such as your wonderful broadcast can publish the alternative so that people will understand what their rights could be. The next one is when they are taking that shot, so far as the gaming control board is concerned, from my, again, anecdotal situation and speaking directly with agents, to my surprise, I don't believe there was a debriefing of agents relative to this uh, seminal decision. And instead, these guys, the guys on the ground, still think that the casino can withhold unless the patron proves that they won the money there. So when they show up, they don't say pay it. They say, this is a gaming dispute. Um, here's your rights, make a complaint or what have you. So that happens. Now here's where it gets weird. The bosses over there absolutely understand Young. And what the I'm seeing- The bosses at the gaming control. Pardon? The bosses the of the gaming the, control. The guys, the senior agents and the gaming control board, all of them understand Young. Like I said, I don't see any evidence that they debriefed, debriefed the on-the-line on the line, uh, police, the gaming agents of this situation. So now it's over at the gaming control board. One of two things is happening because of the patron dispute. One of two things is happening. Somebody in the know, such as me, for example, and this has happened twice now, I believe, um, will call over there and say, what the hell's going on? You guys had to, to one of the bosses <clears throat> and say, this is a patron dispute over whether or not, not whether or not this guy was a patron, but whether or not he can prove that he got the money from the casino and that's not the test and you know not and you know that's not the test in both of those situations or one that i can certainly recall the response was okay let me look at it and then wait a day and then okay here's what you got to do you got to get in touch with the casino this is not going to be a patron dispute as far as i'm concerned okay now I get in touch with the casino. They've been, they've probably been told, hey, this, you know, you're going to have to pay this one. So the bottom line is to the disgrace of this consumer protection agency to with the gaming control board, the bottom line is that the casinos are still trying to pull it. They have a free shot at the customer and they're going to take it when they can. And before things reach the point of, forcing the issue there the casino is going to cough up the cash the problem with that is that there's no way to stop it from happening and why in god's name are these agents with the gaming control board putting these patrons through this unauthorized and inappropriate process to get their money the agent should show up. The casino says, we don't know if he got that money, if he won that money here or not, and he can't prove it. At which point, under the Young decision, the agent should say, pay the man. And more importantly, somewhere, sometime, the gaming control board has to put on their big boy pants and say, 
casinos can't do this. This is a violation of their licensure. Taking a shot at a patron such as this, which has an on-point decision against that activity from the Nevada Supreme Court, is inappropriate. We're going to have a hearing. And if it turns out that it was done intentionally, maybe with knowledge, possibly without knowledge, because they're charged with the knowledge nonetheless, get fined along the lines of the historic Venetian case, or even put their license at jeopardy. Um, you know, we're going to see this when we see Porky Pig flying over our house, though. Now, if I had a $5,000 chip that the casino didn't want to cash, I could... And I have a slot club card of that place with activity on it. I said, this proves I'm a patron here. Uh, would that help? Would it help what? I don't Me get paid but, my five thousand dollar my five thousand dollar chip cashed. It should help, but one of the problems is, and I will point this out. Some $5,000 chips are RFID chips. Certainly $100,000 chips are RFID and they are tracked impeccably. Okay. They can tell from the chip or from their history with positive um, knowledge that they know that you did not get that chip from the casino. If they have that knowledge, the test is whether they know or should have known that you did not acquire that chip at that casino and they have tracked all their $5,000 chips sufficiently or all of their, uh, or if it's a bigger denomination, that particular chip to know who every recipient was. And if you weren't one of the recipients you are probably going to get hung out on that chip. Now, I think that they could guard against this if they would, I mean, the casino would have a lot better shot at this if they didn't green up ordinary blackjack pay players and others with $5,000 chips, but they still do. And I would suggest that if it's a casino of any import, they're not going to be able to show that. Also, any listener of this show should never, ever accept a $5,000 chip from a casino. Just tell them, I do not want those. They're bad luck. Only give me 1000 and less. The other thing to do, and Richard, I agree with you completely, and I think I've even said that on this show before, but one of the other things would be when they ask you to color up, don't. Yeah. I don't care how big a pocket you need, find it and you put those chips in there and just walk away. Yep. Hopefully. Yep. Yeah. That's good too. <laughs> All right. All right. Next question C Civil asset forfeiture. Uh, there's recent news that Arizona is working on or has already passed legislation to prevent this. Is there any promise on the horizon that other states will follow this lead? Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine, and the answer appears to be likely no. Um, again, you're dealing with bureaucrats who have their own interests and the interests of um, their citizens. So if you can put your hands on at, at risk or at issue, if you're a cop in, let's stay with Arizona where this actually happened, you take a casino winner and find hundreds of thousands of dollars in his trunk, and he explains he's a casino winner, and they still just take the money and they say it's drug related. Um, and this guy is from Idaho. And the money was won in uh, Florida. How cool for them 
to be able to take that money? And why should they limit their abilities short of the Supreme Court telling them not to? Uh, blessed are all of us that in Arizona, as it considers this, actually has some collective morals that say theft is bad. But do you think other bureaucrats generally follow that rule or the legislators behind them? If the theft is bad is dealing with theft from people who have no relation to their state other than driving through it? I don't think so. So I don't see anybody moving on this materially unless we get some federal legislation or a simple due process decision that says that money is not criminal. Um, I go back to this, and I've said this before. Pull out any bill from your wallet. Look at it. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public, and the next word, and private. Okay? So it's legal tender for a fentanyl purchase. That's a terrible thing to say in today's world, but they're telling us it is. And then every day they're taking away that ability to make it legal tender for private debts that cause the state some consternation. Uh, they should stop doing that. They should get back to where we were. All this money laundering bullshit is bullshit. Um, and uh, now that we're moving to digital currency, good luck on keeping your money when you start speaking against the government or talking like I'm talking now. Um, and it's just getting worse and worse. So do I see a trend going the other way or on the horizon? Not really. I will tell you some of the stuff I've seen and some of it even results from some of the cases I brought because I said this is another passion area of mine. Um, I've done four of these forfeiture cases and I'm three out of four. Um, some of them reaching as in, in an ancillary fashion as high, as high as the United States Supreme Court. <clears throat> And the, what I saw a couple of times in the last few years that I found heartening is at least where I live in Nevada, our state highway patrol doesn't scoop up everything. They will listen to you. And if you have a colorable explanation, such as I'm going to the Mecham auction, and there is a Ferrari I'm bidding on, and this is my purchase money. Um, they made the, the officer on the scene. It's actually the local prosecutor's call, but the officer on the scene will check up the ladder. And in Nevada, I've seen him back off from what would ordinarily be a likely forfeiture from an advantage gambler. Um, and uh, somebody's... It really depends on the local prosecutor if he and whether or not he can understand that people have legitimate reasons for having a lot of money. Most just balance against that by saying, if they can't prove they do, we get the cash. Terrible situation. So is this the Bob Nersessian gets to rant show? I don't know. <laughs> Haven't banged That's the table yet. Like. <laughs> uh, I have two, but I've got a pillow on it. Aha, uh -huh, good. All right. So next question. You return to a property where you've been trespassed, playing unrated. Does, does a casino have the ability to, to detain you based solely on their visual identification of you? If so, how would that affect the decisions by officers to arrest or the subsequent decision to prosecute? I guess this is a question that we'd like Bob Nersessian to say what they can do versus what he thinks they would do. Okay. First of all, if you return to a property where you have been tr previously trespassed playing on and playing on while playing unrated, even if they didn't get your ID or anything, you are trespassed at least in Nevada. Some states like New Jersey have placed time limits on that trespass. Other states don't allow commercial entities without a legitimate disorderly conduct type reason to trespass people who are merely 
accessing the public amusement, which is a casino. But in Nevada, when they tell you leave and don't come back ever, you have been given an effective trespass warning provided it comes from the owner or the occupant of that casino. So that being said, um, where does this guy think that what he's doing is okay? I don't even understand the question from the sense of, I'm breaking the law. Do I get to get away with it? No. <laughs> All right. Um, but as to the practical effects that he's uh, dealing with in his question, there is or has been reported to me an unwritten policy that absent a photo demonstrating that a trespass warning was given, the police who subsequently arrive will not arrest you. They will give you what is called a trespass warning, which is on a form provided by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I assume there's a similar one up north or around the state, which is called a trespass warning. And now there's a public record that you've been trespassed. The problem with this is I've read that thing very carefully. Every single time they write one and they give trespass warnings to people who have never been trespassed before, that citation warning specifically says that you have committed the crime of trespass and they make that a public record. They've got to fix that form because right now, every time they write that trespass warning, they're hanging out their municipality for false, or not false imprisonment, for defamation by literally stating that you have committed a crime when you haven't. Um, can't figure out why I haven't been able to convince a prosecutor of this yet, but uh, in the past, that type of evidence has certainly helped the cases I have brought. Um, because they will often give it, <laughs> you'll see this, the, the cops will show up because the casino called them. They walk into the back room and there's the guy sitting there in handcuffs. Got one of these right now. Um, and they look over at the casino manager on video in the room going, why is he back here? And the casino manager says we wanted to give him a trespass warning. And the cop says, or we wanted to have you give him a trespass warning. The cop says, has he been trespassed here before? Are we arresting him? No, we just want him to have a warning and we want a record of it. The proper response by that police officer at that point is let this man go, put your hands behind your back, and you're under arrest for false imprisonment. What right would a casino security officer have to hold a person in handcuffs against their will so that the cops can say, you be nice in the future. And that's what's going on. And nobody, well, me a little bit, but generally nobody's stepping in to fix it. I've got acknowledgments from people representing the police that, yes, that can't be done. And it is a false imprisonment. I, hell, I got a judgment saying it. And that the cop who allows it to go forward until the trespass warning is given is himself committing false imprisonment. Um, anybody stepping away from this happens every day from what I see. You know, as I sit here and rail against the uh, machine, if you will, let me point out that this is still a pretty darn nice place and these incidents are somewhat few and far between. But they happen, and they should be evident enough. I, I need, in my entire time in this state, I have seen two security officers charged for actions like this and dozens not charged. I don't understand why the police think that casinos can take people into custody without a crime being committed, but it happens all the time. Next question. Most people know ID is required when cashing out above the CTR levels. 
but I've heard okay. the Vatican. I want to point out when stop you right there, Bob. Everybody knows ID is required when cashing out above the CTR levels. What's the law that says that? I have no idea, but I believe it to be true that when you cash out for more than 10,000, or maybe it's 10,000 or more, um, a CTR is required to ask. The law doesn't say you're required to give it, right? They're even required to demand, but... The law doesn't say you have to give it. Okay? Right, but but they have to uh, basically tell you you can't uh, play anymore if you're not going to give up ID. And you also have to, at that point, file a CTR because that refusal raises the... Or not a, an SAR. SAR, Because yeah. the refusal raises the suspicion and you have to file a CTR. They say, well, if that's the law... There's a line on that CTR form that says, on that FinCEN form that says name. What do we put there? The answer is unknown, would not provide, or quote, refused, close quote. The answer is not, you can't do this. There's no law that says you can't do this, but that's what happens. That's, And if you do do it, let me point out, first of all, this is an opinion. It is perfectly possible that a that a court will say as that form says name and that's the form that has been produced by the regulatory agency you have to provide the name i think that's a weak argument but it could work um and then the next thing is if you continue to refuse you're just opening a can of worms that's going to go on for a year and a half you're going to have to file a lawsuit under your own name. They're going to get the information there. So it's a fait accompli. So finish your question, Bob. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. Actually, I'm loving this because um, we're not getting through very many questions, and we have a lot of them, which means we're going to ask you back next week, too. And uh, and your shows are popular, and and I so I love this. This is um, I have no objections whatsoever to anything that's happened today. Um, so everybody knows ID is required when cashing out above the CTR levels, but I've heard Nevada can require ID at the three thousand dollar threshold, but I can't find that official information. Is this true? Personal story by the person who submitted the question. I was at a Vegas casino cashing out less than 3000 and they refused without ID. After a brief back and forth, they claimed it was for age verification. I called gaming agent and he said that they could ask for ID, but if it was for age verification, but I could try showing them my ID with all the information covered except my birth date and picture. It worked this time, but I'm wondering what Bob thinks about what the agent said. I think the agents need to be schooled. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, and there's even an expert that has written a learned treatise on this subject. I think his name is Zajic, uh, that acknowledges that casinos have no right to demand ID and no right to require production ever. The, I, the age question is a red herring that is total garbage by the casino. Why is that? Because anybody walking up to that cage with chips should have already been ID'd under their policies at the table where they acquired the chips. So what is this now? That you get to stand at the casino window and uh, they hand you back your ID and they go, and you say, well, pay my chips. And they go, let me see some ID. And then this goes on for 14 hours until you get tired of it. No, once you show ID, you've shown ID. Okay. And that casino cage personnel, especially the person in charge of that cage, should recognize that you have already shown ID. The other thing is that you can tell them what table you played at. They can walk up to the dealer and say, did you check his ID? There is no requirement that you produce identification to prove your age. Once you've already gambled, 
And here's where it gets even a little dicier. The idea that the casino wants to know if you're over 21 is crap. If you're standing at the cage with chips, the last thing they want to know is that you are under 21, which is the only relevant information they can get by looking at your ID. Why is that the last thing they want to know? Because they just committed a huge crime that puts their license at risk, and now it's documented. Why would any criminal want to turn themselves in with that? And what did they do? If it turns out that your ID says you're under 21, they let you gamble. And letting people gamble under 21 is taken very seriously by the Gaming Control Board. So do you really think that that casino, the casino manager and that cage manager wants to see an identification that says that you're 20? That's the last thing they would want. It is just a feint that is generally used only when they already know you're over 21 for the purpose of preparing a dossier on you which exceeds what they're entitled to. All right, let me push back on this a little bit. Have you yell at me instead of the table? Um, what if it's a slot ticket? I missed my Where pillow. The, what if it is a slot ticket? On a slot ticket, when you're playing a machine, uh, they typically do not ask for ID when you start to play and you could conceivably cash out for 2000, not, um, doesn't have to be a a jackpot of that size, but you could cash out for 2000. Now, when you're trying to cash this $2,000 ticket, conceivably they could ask for ID. Yes. Conceivably that, well, they can ask for ID whenever they want to. It's not a conceivably. It's the question is conceivably, can they compel identification? And the answer is no. There is no law that allows them to compel you to provide identification. Okay. And the second part about this is putting their license at risk. In your experience, how many casinos have lost their casino license because they have let underage gamblers gamble? Or face None. considerable fines. None. You want to know why? Because why? They, police it, they police it very aggressively on the front side. You go to a table, they ask for ID. You're sitting at a slot machine and you look like you might be under 21. And I've seen this happen to people who were with me. The personnel on the floor are told to go up to you and ask for ID. And if you refuse to provide it, put them out of the casino. That's part of their training. And that is part of the policy of functionally every casino here because they are so aggressive. Finding someone who who is literally gambling under the age of 21 is not that common of an experience. You hear about it sometimes. Um, and when it does happen, it's because they're playing, it's generally because they are they are already on property with false ID which if you in good faith check a false ID and it appears colorable, they haven't committed a crime. So it behooves them to be very aggressive on this one. And generally from what I've seen, they are. All right. Did I just use the word behoove? (laughs) Yeah. I I behave you're correct. It's a a legal scrabble word, so you're okay. (laughs) And with cashing out at tribal casinos, I can assume they can demand ID for any amount. If they don't have an ordinance that says that they can, I would suggest that they can't, but you're not going to get your money. I, I have, I don't know the answer to this question and it's my question to the world. Um, these sovereign nations within our country that are acting commercially within the United States but have that tribal benefit that is given to them of governing their own affairs, I don't know how far that goes. It certainly goes through what is on their tribe and you'd have to use an administrative or the administrative results 
But if you are denied due process or there is a taking by this tribe without due process, I think there's a good solid argument that despite sovereign immunity, final review of the decision of that that tribe's highest court could be taken to the United States Supreme Court. Don't know that anybody's tried it. Don't know that that's resolved. Um, But I would be interested to see if the Supreme Court would allow a tribal casino to just take the money off your table by their police force and keep it and say, screw you. Like to see that tried somewhere. All right. Since Bob just just said, screw you, we're going to have commercials right now. The South Point has more than 10,000 games returning at least 99%. This is more such games than anyone else has. The December promotion is pay less with your points. December 12th through 24th, 50% off in using your slot club card for things such as bars and restaurants, hotel, gift shop, liquor store, bingo, bowling, movie, showrooms, spa and salon, and New Year's Eve events. You don't have to earn the points in December. You just have to have them and you get half price of almost everything. It's a good deal. If you're serious about card counting, the Blackjack Apprenticeship Membership is a great way to learn, train, network, and get the resources you need to succeed. We've had quite a few guests on Gambling with an Edge who exclusively trained and got their start through Blackjack Apprenticeship. Check out the website at blackjackapprenticeship.com. They have member forums, training software, and guides to help you learn. So that's blackjackapprenticeship.com, and you will find a link in the show notes. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 per month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Bonus Streak Ultimate X. This is a 10 coin per line version of the game. Like every other Ultimate X games, you earn multipliers on this hand to be played off next hand. Compared to regular Ultimate X, the multipliers are much harder to get, meaning you need to typically get three of a kind rather than a pair of jacks or better. But when you get them, you save them for several hands in a row. This means they never go completely away and you you can't play them off by betting five coins a hand rather than 10. The, the simplistic strategy is if you come across such a game and the multipliers are higher than your bet, it's a play. So if you're playing triple play and the multipliers are higher than 15, it's a bet. If you're playing five play and they're higher than 25, it's a play. And at the end of the hand, you reevaluate it if it's high enough to play. Now, that's a quickie in and out bet, but it can be done profitably. If you're interested in getting an edge at sports betting, then unabated.com is a great resource for you. Founded by frequent gambling with an edge guests, Captain Jack and Rufus Peabody, Unabated is designed for both new and experienced sports bettors. Their real-time odds screen, tools, and calculators take a lot of the guesswork out of trying to quantify your edge. There's also plenty of free education and instruction to help you along your journey to becoming a sharper sports better. You can currently take advantage of a seven-day free trial to decide if premium membership at unabated.com is right for you. All right, we're back talking to Bob Nersessian giving him one more chance to bang his pillow. There are a ton of things. <laughs> I'm sorry? Can we rephrase that? <laughs> oh, okay. We are back talking with Bob Nersessian for insight into legally betting while banging on All your right. pillow. <laughs> All right. 
There are a ton of new sports books opening up. I've gotten limited at one of the books there. I would love to open an account in my wife's name and do the betting, have her do the betting. I'm not sure the risk of this. Have you heard of people opening up accounts in spouses or friends' name and facing legal repercussions? Any insight would be great. I've heard of casinos taking shots at people who have done that. Um, there was a federal case out of uh, Southern District of California that also dealt with that. And it certainly wasn't a legal repercussion. They were asserting um, violation of the rules, which they then extrapolated to violation of the contract. Um, in Nevada, we have the Chen case that says your identity is not material to a gambling contract. Uh, rather, it's whether each side agrees to the contract, whatever it may be, and whoever you may be. Um, so I think there'd be certainly a hurdle that may be unsurpassable in Nevada to turn that into a problem. I also know that many casinos um, tend to look the other way, at least if your spouse is there and you're playing two machines and there's a card in each of them and you're playing your spouse's rather than yours and she's playing yours rather than hers. Um, and uh, so I don't know the answer to the question. I dealt with this once early on with respect to um, gambler's bonus. And the result there was uh, you got paid in 86. <laughs> um, so uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer to the question except that it is likely not fraud in Nevada. Okay. And I, I don't see other states not necessarily, or I don't see other states um, thinking Nevada was particularly in error with its decision because the bottom line is you put something, you, the casino put the game out there. It's available to everybody and the name or identity of the player should not be material. Well, but sports betting books frequently limit players to sums like they can bet any amount they want up to $5 or something like that because they think the player is too good for them. They would not want that player playing, betting $1,000 on his spouses with pretending he's a, somebody else's ID. So that's different than a slot machine. Oh, I get it. But uh, I... <laughs> Personally, I have a problem with them limiting you to $5 because you're a good better. How is it that casinos are allowed to open up as a public amusement to publish things that they will play and accept and then willfully go out of their way to make sure that smart people can't do it? Well, especially in sports betting where they're willing to take a bet on either side, right? Like you can yeah. bet either and, and side. And we know the rationale, game, Richard, unless you but pick yes. the right one. <laughs> so I'm just yeah. You know, I so I, I I'm just aggravated by the whole thing. I really would like in some senses to have the uh Benny Binion paradigm return, which is we'll take on all comers. Just put your money down and we'll match it too. Well, except in Benny Binion's case, it was unless you're an advantage player, in which case we'll take you in the basement and beat the crap out of you and send you For to the hospital. For betting, Richard? For a uh, whole card play. Yeah, I understand that. For sports betting, I'm only talking... I understand what you're saying. I'm not saying it. You can deal with his estate. Uh, <laughs> right? But as I understand it, when it came to 
sports betting, if he put out a line, once you walked up to the cage with the money, your bet was taken. Am yeah, I wrong? Actually, I don't think the horseshoe ever had a sports book. You're uh, right. When Benny was alive. But he would take any bet on craps or bob. He would craps, yes. Like that's that. the yeah. one I'm working off of. Yeah. And and he didn't and and he didn't have a problem matching you. Um he didn't have sport. Yeah, I guess you're right. But I, I've seen this with craps, sport, and I know it with craps because frankly, I had an uncle that was a huge player over there. And um and from what I understand, would sup with Benny, and uh, his money was always welcome uh, once he put out the wager. Well, I think what he was was each player's wager was his first bet. So if you wanted to bet a hundred thousand dollars and that was your first bet, then that was your limit. But you couldn't start off with one thousand and build up to a hundred thousand. And, and bankroll it that way. But whatever your first bet was, that was your limit. That's how I understood it worked there. Although I never yeah, bet that's 100, what that's what he said. And there was a guy who came in and bet 777000 on the crap table. And then that same guy came back and bet a million uh, on one roll on the crap table. So, yeah, he would, he would book the action. I mean, you know, he admitted to murdering at least two people and was otherwise an awful human being but uh, you know uh, why he's feed it, feeded by this community is kind of beyond me but anyway I digress well he also admitted to murdering two white people and he, the other ones didn't count in his mind so but I digress Boy, you right. guys are out there <laughs> but next question if I buy in for $8,000 on each shift the same day and the casino does not issue me a CTR, is that structuring? Yes. That was easy. <laughs> How isn't structuring How dealing? The crime, is, the crime is. Well, no. The answer is it depends. No, structuring deals with cashing out. Doesn't deal with buying in, does it? Um, it's any oh, cash I transaction. Your, I just heard your question. Yeah. Um, no, structuring deals with cash transactions within a twenty-four hour period. They are aggregated. So yeah, that's structuring. Well, wait a minute. I mean, I'm playing blackjack and. No. As I mean, I'm playing, I lose and get in 8,000, you know, and, but then, you know, it's three hours later before I need more because I'm still playing on that money. It's the casino's it responsibility to keep track of it. Yes, it's structuring. Is it criminal? No, you're lacking the intent element. There's no money laundering at issue. And you weren't doing it to structure. You were doing it to keep cash on the table. The problem is that the casino is at risk for giving you that second eight grand in the same day. And unless so they run up follow the regs. But if they put out a CTR immediately, then they're no longer at risk. Right. And you aren't either. And if they don't put out the CTR, are, is a player obligated to remind them or is smart to remind them? Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> you stop my job, know. man. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. I only pretend to be one on TV. Um, that's, okay. it. that's it. That's it. All right. Good. I wouldn't remind. I Would I remind them? I would not even have it cross my mind either way. All right. So um, we're having fun and we're out of time. So when I said we're going to invite you back next week, that's a serious threat. I, uh, you, we will invite you for next week. Uh, whether or not you have time to accept is up to you. But we got lots more questions and we didn't come close to going through it. So 
it has been fun and we thank you and um and maybe we'll be seeing him next week so the end of the show at the end of the show uh we have a recommended section so richard do you have a recommended for our audience today yeah, my recommended is uh, a guy, a magician that I follow on Instagram, uh, and his name is Jackie Yu, J E K I Y O O. Uh, I believe he's Korean, and uh, so they're just very short, you know, magic tricks. Um, and kind of his catchphrase is at the end of every trick, he goes, "Oh my." And um, anyway, he's very entertaining, uh, high energy. And uh, these are not, you know, big tricks with tigers jumping out of boxes. They're mostly things with cards and everyday items. But um, I find him very entertaining. And each video clip is, you know, maybe 30 seconds long or something. So it's uh, Jackie Yu. And uh, we will have a link to that in the show notes. Is that on YouTube? Uh, yes, he's also on YouTube. He was on um, uh, Penn and Teller's Fool Us. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's a lot. That, I, the thing I like about Instagram is they're, they're just very short. You know, on YouTube, you might find a, you know, 20-minute show or whatever. But um, so. Very good. So my recommendation is a Netflix series, The Crown, Season 5. Now, The Crown is a Netflix series covering the reign of uh, Great Britain's Queen Elizabeth II. Seasons one through four covered the years between 1950 and 1995. And the actors would be switched out every season or two as they represented the aging of the characters they were portraying. Uh, debuting November of this year, season five backtracks a little and covers the years between 1990 and 95 that weren't about things that weren't heavily covered before. It's an entirely new set of actors. Uh, now, not the only theme of these, but the Charles Diana marital problems take center stage in season five. It's hard for me to know how historically accurate this is. It uh, definitely follows the general outlines of what really happened, but private conversations are recreated where at least some of the time the show has to make best guesses as to how it all went down. For consumers like me, who only took a casual interest in these events as they actually happen, these series look accurate, and it's my understanding of what did happen, because that's the best information I have. Bob Narcessian, do you have a recommended for our audience? Well, I'm looking around at your audience and the country I'm living in today and the division and all the other stuff that we're fighting about and how picky so much of it is that I realized and I checked it and um, it's been 21 years since the HBO series Band of Brothers was released. And I got to imagine that there's a whole decade of adults now that only heard about it remotely, are out there politically, are uh, dealing with today and where America falls in history. And I think everybody should watch that show. And if you haven't seen it before, you need to because it's going to give you a perspective on from whence you came and where you should be going versus where you say you're going. All right. Do you know where that is currently found? Uh, you can HBO buy it Matt. on Amazon Prime. You sort of have to purchase it or belong to HBO. Yeah, if you have HBO okay. Max, it should be on there. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I recently watched it for the second time all the way through and, uh, it was, it, 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 it takes you to your knees 10 times over the series. All right. Thank you, Bob Nersessian. Thank you, Richard. 
Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.